Okay, so let us get started. It's so nice to see that we have people tuning in from all over the US and all over the globe. We want to welcome you here today. My name is Carolyn McCarthy and I am here representing the UMass Lowell Climate Change Initiative. And I'm also joined here by Yasmin Zahar, who is representing Climate Interactive. Again, we're really grateful for you to be here today. Um, just acknowledging that we're living in such an interesting time and uh, want to take a moment to welcome you however you're arriving to this space. Um, we're now, you know, as you know, shifting our work lives uh, online and as educators and maybe as parents, if some of you are parents here today, we're really looking for some robust and engaging and fun tools to use with our students uh, and maybe with our children. So um, today we're going to be talking about just that. So we'll be talking about the World Climate Simulation, which translates quite well from an in-person experience to this online format. And alongside talking about the tool itself, we'll also be talking about how you can leverage some of the functionalities of uh, remote conferencing technology, such as Zoom, uh, to really keep that experience engaging and help uh, students connect with each other while we're, while we're online here. All right, so here we are. So the World Climate Simulation is uh, an engaging role play or a debate where participants take on the role of delegates um, from, from around the world in a UN conference and they aim to negotiate a global climate agreement. And we call this simulation a simulation for two different reasons. The first reason is that it's a simulation in that the participants are simulating their role. So they come in representing various nations from around the globe to advocate for their regional interests during this mock UN climate conference. And so the UN climate negotiations happen every year. And as you know, in 2015, countries came together and agreed on the Paris Climate Agreement, which aims to limit temperature change to well below two degrees Celsius. So this goal of well below two degrees Celsius is also the aim for your participants as well. And simulating the negotiations between regions uh, will help provide a way to make this process feel more real for them and also makes some of the dynamics around this challenge come to life. Um, we also call this a simulation for another reason, and that's because these decisions that your delegates will be making are going to be entered into the C Roads model that stands for Climate Rapid Overview and Decision Support model, where their actions are going to be simulated in real time and you'll be able to receive feedback on the various outcomes that come from their decisions, um, including impacts on global temperature increase. So uh, we have the map here, which shows you some of the places where world climate has been run. Uh, so there's been a wide range of audiences who have played the game from you know, middle schoolers to uh, different leaders and organizations and government. The game has been facilitated over a thousand times played by over 60,000 people in 88 countries. And we're really excited that you'll all be facilitating and adding more pins to this map. Um, another note about this map is that uh, we also have materials for this game that are translated into several different languages. So you can check out Climate Interactive's website for those translations. And then I saw this question in the, uh, in the chat box already, so I'm glad we're getting to it right at the beginning. Some of you may be familiar with the En-ROADS model that was launched just recently at COP25 in Madrid in December. And I consider, I, I call these two simulations siblings in that they're very similar, um, but there are a few key differences. So in world climate, participants are divided by countries. And so you can see some examples here, those representing the European Union or those representing China. Um, and it's really founded and based in the C roads model that I referred to earlier. So in this simulation, this is the focus of our webinar today, um, there, your participants will have the opportunity to discuss the regional contributions to climate change past and future. Now with the climate action simulation that you can see at the bottom of the screen, uh, participants are divided by various stakeholder groups. 
So no longer regions or countries of the globe, but stakeholder groups. And some examples are pictured here. So you can see uh, they have conventional energy supply, for example, renewable energy, land use and agriculture. Um, and so the model behind this simulation is the En-ROADS model, which is similar to the C-ROADS in that it, it builds upon the foundation of the uh, climate structures, but it has additional energy structures built into that model. And the real focus of this climate action simulation is on solutions to climate change. So I'll take a moment to transition and Yasmin will now talk a bit about the logistics of world climate and how it can be translated to this online experience. Great, thanks, Carolyn. So going into the logistics here in how this game actually works, uh, seeing that most of you are new facilitators, we're gonna break down uh, the game itself, and then we're also gonna be providing those details about how to run it virtually. So the first main decision to make as a facilitator is which version you plan to play. So here we've got a three region and a six region option. So the main difference is just the number of groups. So if you've got a pretty small group, maybe say under 12 participants or so, you'll probably want to use the three region version. If you have a bigger group, uh, maybe between 15 uh, up to maybe 60 people. The sixth region version works great. Uh, virtually, it can be a little bit tough to go more than 60 people. Uh, there's quite a bit of kind of technical platform features to navigate. So we'd recommend uh, not having a really massive group for this. Um, but given the amount of participants, uh, you can choose between the six region and the three region. In the three region version, your participants are divided into three different groups. So we've got our developed, which is our developed countries. We have our developing A group, which is our rapidly emerging economies. And then we have our developing B group, which is everybody else. And in the six region version, the main difference is just that we've pulled out uh, a couple countries or regions. So we have the United States as its own group, the European Union as its own group, and then all other developed nations. And then we have China as its own group, India as its own group, and then all other developing nations. And alongside these delegations and these country groups, we also have these optional additional groups. So it's really up to you if you want to use these groups or not. They function a little bit different than these country or regional delegations uh, in that they don't submit official pledges during the role play, but they are able to advocate for their priorities. So it's up to you if you wanna use these groups. Maybe if you do have a pretty big audience size and you might benefit from more than six groups, uh, you might take uh, a couple of these on. Uh, you don't have to choose all of them. If you are an educator and maybe you have uh, some teaching assistants, they might be able to take on these roles themselves. So it's up to you if you wanna use these groups. Um, so your first decision is which version you wanna use, three region or six region and then whether or not you want to use these additional groups as well. And given who your participants and who your audience is going to be, uh, if you are an educator and you already know who your students or who your class is made up of and you know who your participants are going to be, we'd recommend assigning those groups in advance. If that doesn't apply to you maybe you've opened this up to your community and you aren't entirely sure who might show up until the day of that's okay too you can just assign groups at the beginning of the session but if possible we would recommend assigning the groups in advance so that people can get a little context of who's in their group 
which group they're in, and they're also able to review the materials. So there's two main materials that you'll give your participants. The first one is this confidential briefing statement. So essentially, this is a document that outlines the priorities of the particular region or country. So it gives the participants an idea of uh, the role that they should take on, what their priorities are, what they might propose. And it's also a really good way to just get everybody on the same page. So this is a way that makes the simulation accessible to people who maybe don't have any kind of previous knowledge on climate negotiations. So if you're wondering if this simulation makes sense for your participants who might not be super well versed on the issue, these briefing statements really help with that. Uh, and we really try to make it so that it's accessible for anyone. They just have to kind of read the briefing sheet and play along with their role. So they'll have that briefing sheet to look over and then they'll have this proposal form. So the proposal form is what they'll be submitting to the UN summit. So this is what they will fill out as a group when they're in their role play. So they'll fill out their region name and then they've got three decisions to make with greenhouse gas emissions. So they'll decide based on their briefing statement if and when they want to peak their emissions and then they'll decide if and when they want to reduce their emissions and at what rate and then following that there's two decisions about forestry and land use so we've got prevention of deforestation and then the afforestation effort so for both of these boxes, the group will fill out a number between zero and 100. So what that means is zero is no change from the business as usual. So that means they'll just continue doing what they're currently projected to do. And 100% means they'll take the maximum possible action they can on either preventing deforestation or uh, implementing an afforestation effort. So it's really the amount of effort that they are taking on a scale of zero to 100. And then the final piece deals with climate finance. So each group decides whether they want to contribute or request money from this global fund. And this last one is really used as a negotiating tactic and it allows different groups to leverage uh, the funding aspect of it when they're uh, exchanging proposals and we'll go into a little bit more detail about what exactly that means so those are the two materials that each group needs so if you are able to assign groups in advance uh, what you'll do is you'll assign each person to a group and you'll send them the corresponding briefing sheet and this proposal form and at the end of the webinar we'll be going through our website and uh, showing you where you're able to find all of these materials so we have the proposal forms we have the briefing sheets and we've also set up uh, some google spreadsheets for how you might assign different groups uh, so that it's easier uh, when you're virtually sending out these materials. So going into what a typical agenda looks like, we're going to go into each of these in detail, but just to give uh, more of a holistic picture as to how the simulation runs, we've been finding that online it's taking uh, a little bit longer than it has usually in person. Uh, so we've seen it take about three hours typically. Uh, this is because we're breaking out into groups a little bit more often. Sometimes people take a little bit more time to get familiar with the platform. And so um, we recommend around three hours. We also, as 
is for the rest of this simulation and all of the materials, we always encourage you to make it your own. So if three hours just isn't possible, you're more than welcome and we encourage you to shorten that a little bit and really just play with this agenda and fit it to your time limit, to your audience. Maybe you don't have as many rounds. Maybe things are just a little bit quicker. Uh, it's really up to you to tailor this to your time limit. A lot of times in classrooms, uh, teachers might decide to split this up over two courses. So you do half of it in one class and then the following week, for example, you'll finish it. So uh, of course, feel free to tailor this agenda to whatever works best for you. But uh, this is what we've seen work well. So kind of going through it quickly and then we'll go into more detail. So as the facilitator, you'll give a quick introduction at the beginning, just as yourself uh, introducing the platform, introducing this context of the game. If you haven't been able to assign groups yet, uh, this would be the time to do that. Uh, if you're able to have somebody supporting you, we found that extremely helpful. Um, we're most familiar with uh, playing this on Zoom and to create the breakout rooms and to assign people to them takes a little bit of time. So we usually have one person facilitating and presenting and then somebody else supporting kind of behind the scenes, uh, creating those breakout rooms, answering people's questions on chat and things like that. Um, so if that's possible, we would recommend a team of maybe two or three people. If it's not possible, again, that's totally fine. Uh, if it's just you facilitating it, that's perfectly fine. If uh, you might just have to give a little bit more context to your group, maybe let them know that you need to take a little bit of time to make the breakout groups and they can review their materials in the meantime. So up to you how you're able to kind of spread out those facilitating duties. But in either case, somebody will be giving this introduction. And then before going right into the role play, we found that in a virtual setting, it's useful to break your participants out into their groups um, just pretty quickly, just to give them uh, an introduction to this breakout room feature. So this is a feature that we find pretty necessary for the simulation. So we're most familiar with uh, Zoom. Uh, we know some educators have been using Blackboard Collaborate for this breakout room feature. So those are the two we're most familiar with. If you're planning to run this on a different platform, feel free to share it in the chat so that we can maybe start familiarizing ourselves with those new platforms and might be able to offer some more context as well for those. But for whichever platform you're using, we recommend that it has this breakout feature, which basically puts people into private rooms. So each uh, group would have their own room that they can go in privately and speak amongst themselves. So you'll break people out and they'll do a quick introduction amongst themselves, maybe review the materials, and then you'll bring them back in and open the conference more officially in your role as a UN official. So maybe as the teams are in their breakout rooms, you can put on a blazer or a scarf and really show that you've taken on this new role and really encourage your participants to take on their roles as well. So after you've opened up the conference, you've encouraged everybody to take on their roles you've given them a bit of guidance as to what they need to accomplish with their proposals, you'll move into the first round of proposals. So you'll break people out into their breakout groups and they'll discuss amongst themselves, fill out that proposal form, and then everyone will come back into the plenary and each group will give their proposal speeches and share what it is that they're proposing. And then the really unique part of the simulation is that you then get to enter in their proposals into this model, C-Roads, and look at the impact of their proposals. 
and you can see what exactly the temperature change will be by 2100. So you're able to kind of analyze their proposals. So after you've done that, you'll enter into another round of proposals, maybe encouraging people to have stricter proposals, put on stricter targets. And with these additional rounds of negotiation, uh, we do try to have teams negotiate with each other. Uh, we'll go into some of the technicalities of what that looks like, uh, but that's where you might do that. And then given your time, you might do that uh, an additional time as well, following the same process of breaking people out into groups, having them propose something and negotiate with each other, come back into the plenary, give their speeches, put their proposals in the model, uh, and then you can close the summit. So you can share with people how they're doing, what they've accomplished, and then just close out the summit and pull out of your roles and everybody just returns to themselves and then you enter into the debrief. So I know that was quite a lot of information, but we're gonna break it down quite a bit now. And also just noting that we are certainly going to take some time at the end to answer your questions. So please feel free to enter those in as we go through this. So going into some more detail here. So here we have uh, our facilitator in the middle with his suit on uh, who's giving his opening remarks as a UN official. So that might be the Secretary General of the UN, that might be the Executive Secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. If there are more than one of you facilitating, you can share those roles. Uh, and then you'll be giving instructions as to what it is they need to propose. And we've created those slides for you. We've created those scripts for you. So you don't have to worry too much about what exactly you'll say, or if you aren't entirely sure what you'll say, we've created all of that material for you that of course you can feel free to uh, edit as you wish. You'll also notice here that some of the participants have flags behind them. Uh, that's another feature that we've started testing a little bit. Um, in Zoom, uh, there's the virtual background feature and we find it uh, pretty fun for participants to change their backgrounds to their team so that they can all see each other and know who's on which team. Uh, those are also available on our website as we walk through those materials later on. Uh, so we find that that's a pretty Fun addition, not necessary, but a good way to get a visual sense of the different teams. So after you've given those remarks, you'll move on to the breakout groups. So this is what it looks like. This is a private breakout group. We've got Team USA here. Uh, we've got our facilitator, Andrew Jones, in the middle who has kind of popped in to just answer any questions and see how folks are doing. And so the team is filling out their proposal form and getting ready to present. So after all of the teams have compiled their proposals, uh, you will bring everybody back into the main plenary and then you'll have each group give a presentation. So here we have a member from Team India who has uh, unmuted themselves and is able to uh, share with the group. And with the plenary presentations, if you are using those additional groups like the climate activists or the fossil fuel lobbyists, uh, they are certainly welcome to give presentations. Even though they're not able to submit official proposals, uh, we really encourage that they give presentations in an effort to kind of sway the country or regional groups. So as each group is giving their presentation, you as a facilitator or someone who's supporting you can write down each group's proposal in a kind of table like this, like a proposal summary. And that can be 
on a slide like this that you can edit. We've also created a Google spreadsheet with this information. And then you're able to compile them all and see them all in one place. And so after you've compiled everybody's proposals, everyone has given their speeches, that's when you're able to go into the C roads model and actually input those proposals. So you'll share your screen and you'll have the model and then you'll be able to enter in those proposals and discuss a little bit about what's happening. And Carolyn is giving us a quick overview of the model if a lot of you are maybe seeing it for the first time. So we're going to break down how to actually use the model itself. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Yasmin. So you should be seeing the interface for the C roads model right now. And I'm going to just take a moment. I did see a, an, a question in the Q and A box about how long it takes to enter the proposal numbers into the, into the simulator itself. So I'll be running through that right now. Um, before we do that, I just want to draw your attention to these three main regions of the interface that are really data rich. So just beginning in the top left hand corner, we have the graph for energy CO2 emissions and you'll see that along the x axis we have the timeline. So from 2000 to around 2020, that is our historical data that's built into the model. And then moving forward out into 2100, all of these projections that are color coded by region are the projections of the scenarios for the business as usual um, scenario. And then of course you see along the Y axis here, gigatons of CO2 per year. So those will, and you'll see that as you enter the information in this bottom left hand corner that these lines will be changing. Um, but before we go there, over to the right, top right hand corner of the screen, we have uh, the same timeline here from the year 2000 to 2100 of temperature increase. Um, just a quick note about this, we have it in degrees Celsius here. And depending on who your audience is, you might want to come over to this window here, view to US units, and you can put these units in Fahrenheit. Uh, for today, I'm going to keep them in metric units. But again, you see the temperature increase over time and you're also reminded here by these two gray dotted lines of what your participants goals are for this simulation. So we have this top gray line is that two degrees Celsius temperature increase. And then we have this bottom line here, the 1.5 degrees Celsius. So it's always good as you're going through and narrating what's happening as you enter the data to, to draw their attention to that goal here in that top right hand corner. And then lastly, we have down here in the bottom left hand corner, this is the part of the interface where you can interact and edit some of the some of the proposals and your information here. So you'll notice that uh, these categories, the emissions peak year, reductions begin year, these are all uh, a mirror of that proposal form that each group will have uh, written in their answers to. Um, and I'll also take a moment to come to this top left hand corner. So right now we have this uh, model set for the sixth region of the simulation. You can also come over here and change it to whichever version of the game that you are running. So right now I just switched it to the three region version. And here we are, you can see that these three lines have changed, temperature increases the same. And we can take a moment to just go through what this may look like. Um, so after all of your participants have given their speeches and made their proposals, you can take that information that you may have collected in that Google Sheets over here to the simulation itself. And this is usually an exciting moment during the simulation because you're going to be receiving direct feedback from the model of um, what impact your decisions have. So let's just say, okay, I'm, I'm from the developed nations and I'm saying that we will have our emissions peak by the year 2030. That's great. Okay, so you saw that that red line for the developed nations just uh, stopped and plateaued at 2030. 
but we want to do even more than that and we want to begin to reduce our emissions let's just say for now uh, five years later so 2035 and again these are up to whatever decisions uh, your participants make you'll notice there wasn't any change there because we have to assign that rate at which those emissions will fall so for now i'm going to put in three percent and there you go you see that the line drops into the future um, we also have here how much we'd like to prevent deforestation and i'm going to just say oh, we'll put a 50 percent effort Ooh, not too much change and let's say a 50 percent effort for afforestation okay and we don't see in this particular graph that we're looking at that there is much change um, before we we see if there are other graphs that could maybe give us a little more insight into if there were any changes due to the uh, land use decisions, we could take a look over here at the temperature increase and you'll see that this black line was the business as usual scenario where we were before the developed nations made their proposals and here we are now and of course we're still at this 3.7 degrees Celsius. Um, so I would encourage you, I'm going to go over here to the graphs. There are so many different graphs um, that you can take a look at and you can prepare yourself before you go into one of these um, simulations by just going through some of these graphs. Uh, one that I will place here are these greenhouse gas emissions and let's just see going back in time here you can start to see that as we make changes now for deforestation they're now um, represented here in the graph so if you just take a look at that red line here i'm going to again put 50 percent and 50 percent and you'll see those changes are made so uh, one more example let's see i'll pretend that i am now um, adding in the information from the developing b nations and i'm going to say okay we don't quite have the capacity at this point to be peaking our emissions in 2030 that's much too soon but i think we can do it by 2040 okay you see the yellow line going down and maybe a few years after that we'll be able to start to bring our emissions down okay and we need to assign a rate maybe they won't be able to do it as um, aggressively as the three percent here we are and again we have the changes that we enter into our deforestation and afforestation parts of the model um, so when you're working with the simulation after you enter in all of the participants or all of the delegates answers you can take a look and take a look over at the temperature increase graph ask them you know have we reached our goal are we there yet not quite and this is a good time for you to send them back usually after the first round of negotiations you don't make it to that two degrees Celsius goal, never mind the well below two degrees Celsius goal. So you send your participants back into negotiations with each other, maybe encourage them to uh, break outside of their groups who they might have been meeting with in the first round and start to um, meet with those from other regions to really negotiate um, more bold action. And it's also a good time here to um, draw their attention to some of the tools that they have such as uh, financing for example to look to the green fund where they're putting in their contributions in their proposal forms but not necessarily in the simulation to make that progress so once you run the simulation and you're done with your simulation you want to move you have an opportunity to move out of your roles and back into yourself and it's a really good idea to take some time to to give everyone a chance to take a break you might want to actually take a break for the simulation um, because perhaps you'll notice during the simulations people get really heated in their debates and people become really committed to their roles and also just a note, we've run uh, research on world climate and the impacts of um, participating in world climate. And we've found that among gains in climate literacy and gains in the intent to take action, 
Um, we also found that 85% of participants in this study showed an increase in the sense of urgency about the climate crisis. So we know that this simulation has an impact cognitively, but it also has an impact uh, affectively. And so it's really important to take this time to debrief to both harvest insights and also process the emotions that come up during the simulation. So thinking back to the map that we looked at with all the implementations across the globe, um, the simulation itself and the, the debriefs have been run in a number of ways. And um, we wanna leave it up to you to run the debrief uh, that you feel is best for your audience. Um, and we also have some suggestions for a few pieces that we suggest that you touch upon in the debrief based on our experience facilitating the simulation. So again, just touching upon the emotions and their experience, a suggestion here would be to begin with asking everyone um, how they felt during the simulation and if there's anything that surprised them. And maybe a nice way virtually to go about this would be first to have everyone reflect and take a moment individually to write down what their experience was and then also break everyone up into smaller groups for almost like a think pair share session so they can they can speak with one or two other members you know ideally of a, maybe a different delegation you can mix developed nations versus de developing nations together to have them uh, share with each other what their experience was and then finally you can bring everyone back to that larger space and ask groups to share what they discussed in their small groups. Um, there are also some insights that you'll find um, that which might come out of the debrief when, um, you know, when, when participants are talking about their feelings, they might also touch upon some of these pieces, which is uh, the scale of action that's required. So we know that this problem is all in, it's all hands on deck and can't be accomplished unless everyone is taking action. Um, another insight that they might find is that this is very urgent, so emissions need to be drawn down very quickly. Um, and you can also refer to some other resources that are on the Climate Interactive and the Climate Change Initiatives website. We have a great systems thinking bathtub dynamics uh, video on our Vimeo account, um, which will talk about and help give some understanding as to why those emissions need to be drawn down so quickly. Um, some other insights is that, you know, the model shows that it's scientifically possible to reach our goals. And really the question is, is how do we make it socially or politically possible? And then, of course, there are the equity considerations. So, you know, on, on the first level, we're working on this uh, global scale. So we're, some of the equity considerations that come up are, well, what regions have historically contributed most to the climate crisis versus what regions will be most impacted and are most vulnerable to this change? Um, maybe you'll also bring up what regions have profited off of the fossil fuel infrastructure and may be better positioned to invest in renewable energy versus those regions which are now beginning to develop fossil fuel infrastructure uh, and where those investments in renewable energy should come from in order to aid them in the transition. Um, and you might also find that there are a number of um, equity considerations that are brought down to a more local level um, in your community. Um, there's also a piece that uh, relates to real world actions and hope. So this is another area that you can prepare for. Um, you can brush up on different national or regional goals and actions that are being taken today. Perhaps if you're running it within an institution, what are your climate action plans? Uh, you can expand it to a larger historical uh, context of social change and uh, you can touch upon youth activism or leadership. Um, and then the last piece, well actually I should also mention that there are also, touching upon the real world, there may be experiences during COVID that your participants bring up and you know maybe one question that you can ask is uh, what seems possible today that might not have seemed possible or uh, before COVID. And there might be other questions about, you know, inequities that might be show, showing up. Um, and then the last piece is connecting your participants to action. So what can you do? And again, everyone has a, a different style for running this debrief. I really love to watch other facilitators and how they um, connect their participants 
Um, I know there's a, a large focus in uh, middle school and high school curriculum about civic engagement and a sense of agency. So really drawing upon some of those opportunities for students to connect to local organizations, to clubs. Um, and you can also talk about different actions that they can take. Uh, maybe it's personal actions that they can take that can contribute positively. Um, as always, if you have if you have ideas or you have experiences from running this debrief that you would like to share, um, you know different ideas for real real world actions or things that bring you hope, uh, then please do share it in the chat box. Uh, we always love to see the different ways that um, others are talking about hope um, as well or connecting their participants to action afterwards. And so uh, we just ran through a way to use Sea Roads and World Climate in a group event online, but there are a number of ways that you can use the same uh, simulation. So you can explore Sea Roads on your own, uh, and you can also complete or assign to your students the Sea Roads homework exercise, which you will find on the Climate Interactive website. And I believe uh, Yasmin will talk a little bit more about those materials. Great, thanks, Carolyn. And uh, taking a quick step back here, I'm seeing quite a lot of questions. So I thought I would maybe address uh, a few of them all at once here um, of a bit more clarification about what happens after that first round and after you've inputted those proposals. So um, Florian, one of our uh, top facilitators of world climate, um, is asking about how you might bring some of that energy uh, as the facilitator from that first round. So in person, uh, a technique that we've seen work really well and that I know Florian does quite often is uh, taking a blue tarp and covering uh, maybe the other developing group just for a moment to indicate that uh, sea level rise uh, has reached a certain level and that a lot of those countries are uh, now succumbing to uh, a lot of that uh, impact. And so with that idea, um, which I think is oftentimes even more important in a virtual session is to really bring the energy and the drama. So something that you could do is bring uh, in an additional slide that shows, okay, we reached 3.4 degrees in that first round. What does that mean? We've reached this amount of sea level rise and maybe verbally go through what that looks like for some of those other developing groups. Um, and so bringing in the energy however you can uh, really works well in a virtual setting. And then a lot of you were wondering about uh, some of the more technical side of those negotiations and those breakout groups. So I'll walk us through a little bit of how we've done it and how we've seen it work quite well. Um, so what we'll do is, uh, speaking with familiarity on the Zoom platform, is everyone will be sent out to their breakout rooms and then everybody has the option to leave their breakout room and go back into the main room. So as the facilitator, you can stay in that main room and if, for example, someone from, in this photo we have a couple different participants from other developing and other developed nations visiting Team China. So what they've done is they've sent one or two people from their group to leave their group. They come into the plenary and then that's what, where you will be as the facilitator. And so they'll let you know that they want to go negotiate with Team China. And then what you're able to do on the back end is move them to a new group. So you would move them to Team China and let them know that you've done that and then they can enter that breakout room. So that seems a little bit uh, technical. So I would work on practicing that. Uh, some more standard or more straightforward options are creating a shared uh, Google Doc and having the groups negotiate that way. 
uh, through the document so they're all able to communicate with each other. Uh, a third option is if your participants know each other, then maybe you'll have a group text or a WhatsApp group chat and they're able to text that way. So there's different options there. Uh, I see a couple folks asking too if those additional groups get uh, like those fossil fuel lobbyists and those climate activists, if they get briefing statements and how they might negotiate. So to answer kind of that within this part here, yes, they do have briefing statements. So they have a sense of what they should be advocating for. And this is really the rounds that are really useful for them is participating in those negotiations. So uh, maybe going into those different rooms and trying to negotiate. And so moving to uh, our materials here. So uh, we'll do a quick overview of our website, noting uh, the time here. Uh, feel free to continue asking your questions. Uh, we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. And we'll also uh, stay a little bit longer uh, to answer those questions. And then you can always feel free to email us. So we'll put our email up before we log off here. Uh, but a quick tour of our website, if you aren't familiar with it, uh, and where you can find all of those materials. The first place you'll want to go is Tools World Climate Simulation Game. So this is essentially your jumping off point. You'll be able to find everything you need from here. So as you're scrolling down, you'll see here, check out the world climate materials. And that's where you'll find the different materials in other languages. If you're planning to run this in a language other than English uh, or in English, you can keep scrolling here. And we have the materials for facilitators. So uh, the facilitator guide, which is essentially a written version of this webinar in a little bit more detail. We have presentation slides. So these are the slides that we've prepared for you. Uh, supplemental slides is just a really long list of slides for you to choose from if you see any that might be useful for you in your main presentation. And then Sea Roads World Climate is the model itself. So the model is available online or as an application that you can download and is totally free to use. So that's where you can start exploring the model before you run your event. And we've created some quick materials that might be useful for virtual use. We're certainly working on getting those a little bit more developed, but some of those Google spreadsheets that I mentioned about assigning different roles, links to all of the briefing sheets, uh, some proposal forms online, and taking into account the different changes that might be required here. And then you have your materials for participants. So this is where you'll find the briefing statements and the proposal form. And as you can see, we've got those briefing statements for the additional groups that some of you were asking about. And then you have this register a world climate event button. So when you click on this, it leads you to this page. And this is really, really important for us. This helps us get a sense of who's running our events. This is how you get your pin on that really great map. Uh, and it really helps us uh, with our metrics and get a sense of who's running our tools. So you're able to register your event before or after you've held it once you just know the details about it. And we're always looking for any feedback and uh, experiences that you're willing to share. So going back here uh, to our support platform, I'll keep this up uh, in case we aren't able to get to all your questions. Uh, please feel free to go to support.climateinteractive.org and that's where you can send us a new support ticket and send us a private inquiry and that'll go directly to us and we can answer you as best we can. And then on that page as well, you'll also have the user forum. 
So what it looks like is here. Here's where you can create your new support ticket and send us any questions that you have, either about this webinar or as you prepare this process. Uh, any point along the way, we're happy to answer your questions. Uh, and then we have forums here. So forums are our user forums. So that's folks like you who are using our tools, who are communicating with each other. So it's a great way to connect with people and share experiences and get advice. So be sure to check that out. Uh, definitely realizing that we've reached our hour mark here. So if you do have to sign off, thank you so much for joining us and uh, feel free to email us here. We have uh, my email and Carolyn's email. And so you can email us directly if you have any questions that we weren't able to answer. Uh, otherwise, if you're able to stay on the line for a few more minutes, we'll happily go through uh, some of your questions here. Right. Carolyn, any that you're seeing, yeah. So there was a, a question. Yes, thank you, Yasmin, and thank you everyone uh, who has to go at this point. We're really grateful to have you. And it looks like we have um, a pretty fair spread across those days and times uh, for, for running the next event where you will, you will be able to play as a participant and get a chance to uh, see what the experience is like. There is a question. So there are a few questions about the simulation that um, either explicitly or I think implicitly point to economic impacts. And so um, one of the questions is, are there any negative ramifications in the simulation for a whole hog approach to decreasing emissions or increasing forestation? Um, so I know that one thing that we can, you know, you can point to in the model itself is going to the uh, graph that shows the um, some of the, the economics of the model. I'm also wondering what your opinion, Yasmin, would be if, if En-ROADS might be a better model to uh, show some of those economic impacts related to the solutions. There's also, um, I also saw a carbon price that was mentioned. Yeah, is there a scope for negotiating carbon prices regionally or globally? Does the tool calculate the carbon tax impact on greenhouse gas reductions? So that's a great question. Um, within C roads, the best way to explore some of those financial aspects is these graphs here. Uh, so as Carolyn mentioned, those uh, economic graphs that you have access to, um, they don't go probably as much into detail as you might hope or expect. Um, so here it's, you're able to kind of take a look at the impact of uh, energy reductions on GDP and how energy intensive uh, the GDP is. But as Carolyn mentioned, our En-ROADS model, which we won't go too into detail about, but is also freely available, that's where you're able to explore uh, the actual solutions and some of the more uh, more range of impacts that you're able to see, including a carbon price. So a great way that we've seen facilitators kind of use both models together is in the debrief, they might pull up En-ROADS. So as I do that now, so En-ROADS is available online at just En-ROADS n-roads.climateinteractive.org. And it looks like this. Uh, you'll notice it's a kind of similar interface. And here's where you can look at more specific solutions. Uh, we offer a wider range of those financial graphs that you might be interested in. So if your participants are maybe more interested in some of those economic or financial impacts, you might bring up En-ROADS here in a uh, debrief, for example. And mm -hmm. for the person asking about a carbon price, that's something that you can take a look at here in En-ROADS. Um, noting though that the biggest difference between En-ROADS and C-ROADS, as Carolyn mentioned, one of the biggest differences is that 
sea roads is broken up by region. So you're, you were asking um, if you can kind of negotiate a carbon price by region. Whereas here, when we adjust this carbon price slider, this is at a global level. So this model does not break out into regions. It's all as if the entire world is implementing this high carbon price, for example. So just a quick look at En-ROADS, uh, you're able to just adjust sliders here and more specific actions than more general emissions reductions in sea roads. That's great. Thank you, Yasmin. And I've run the um, world climate simulation and found that it really does have a natural transition into En-ROADS afterwards, whether it's a full world climate simulation and a little teaser of the En-ROADS simulation, because the, with the first simulation, they really gain those insights about the uh, scale and urgency and ask the question, okay, now what? And what are some tangible solutions? And that's why it's great to um, pass over there at that point. And just also noting that um, the Climate Interactive also has a really great tool called multi-solving that I would encourage you, if you haven't already looked at it yet, it's also on the website, which really helps to um, look at the multiple uh, impacts of various solutions. Um, you know, positive and negative, what those might look like. So it's a way to use this experience and use this activity and tool to connect with those issues that are um, close to some of your participants' um, experience. Um, another question that I saw is just if, if there's any age criteria for the groups to be formed. And um, I know I've run this simulation with middle schoolers. And so we do a bit of scaffolding beforehand to get them familiar with terminology like GDP and what does per capita mean. Um, but for the most part, it's again up to how you feel as a facilitator, um, how you think the group should be split up. So I've had different groups um, that really prefer to have uh, a greater number of people in the developing countries uh, groups versus the developed countries. So there are a number of ways that, that you can decide to um, split up the groups to add a different dynamic to the simulation itself. Yeah, and something I'll quickly add to that too is um, some more resources on our website. So going back to that main world climate simulation page, and that main resources page, which again, we'll be sending out in an email so you don't have to follow along uh, too much here. And so scrolling down here, uh, all the way at the bottom, we have additional materials and we do have some tips uh, that some of our facilitators have helped write on how you might alter it or adjust it a little bit for different circumstances. So these two here being about age. So uh, there's a little bit of advice there that you might take a look at if you're uh, wondering how this works with uh, folks from different age groups. And not to go too much at length, I do see one um, good question just uh, of interest in the chat box. Have you seen a drop off or an increase in interest in C roads or N roads during the COVID emergency? You know, have you seen a, a number of um, applicants for the ambassador training, Yasmin, or what have you seen at Climate Interactive? With engagement yeah, levels? that's a great question. It's been really an experience for all of us to get adjusted. I think uh, the biggest pattern we've seen so far is um, towards the beginning uh, of the stay at home orders as folks were just kind of reorienting themselves a little bit and the circumstance was uh, pretty shocking and pretty new. Um, we noticed people were certainly kind of just focused on adapting their own lives, but we've really seen actually a big increase in engagement because for a lot of people uh, they're spending more time at home. So we've been running uh, webinars for the public and we've had, so just last week for Earth Day, we had about a thousand people join us. So we're really seeing that side of uh, the circumstances increase engagement because people are uh, 
home more, they're able to participate in events more. Uh, we've definitely been communicating with uh, educators who have had to shift their curriculum a little bit and learn about how to run some of these things online. So uh, we are seeing um, more engagement in that sense of people looking for online tools that they can use for their students and even their kids who are now at home. Um, so it's been a mix, but I'd say as we continue on during this time, we're certainly seeing uh, an increase in engagement because people are at home more and they're looking for ways to uh, learn and share different resources with either their students, their kids, or just their communities. Great, thank you. And just seeing that we're approaching 10 minutes past the hour, and a few of the questions that I'm seeing or comments in the chat box um, are related to further logistics about uh, running the game. So you, we encourage you to keep your eyes out for the registration link that we'll be sending where you can experience uh, the simulation yourselves as a participant. And maybe we can even, Yasmin, layer over some of those uh, technical um, tutorials as we go, just to give another helpful tip. Um, but also just a reminder that we will be sending out a follow-up email where we can touch upon some of these other uh, questions and just point you to other resources that may help you either preparing for running the simulation itself or direct you to some of the the tips for logistically carrying this out uh, on Zoom or Teams or wherever you might be doing so. Yeah, definitely. Something I'll add quickly uh, in case you aren't able to join us for that live world climate simulation. I would say one is we're probably planning to record it and then upload it so that anybody can access it and see a little bit more about what it actually looks like. And in the meantime, uh, if you go on our website again and click on this videos page here, we have added some more videos about online use. So for our En-ROADS climate action simulation, under game facilitation, we have a virtual session of the climate action simulation. So even though this isn't world climate, it follows the same structure virtually. So it's something you could skim. So it's a pretty long recording of a session. But if you're interested in maybe just getting a sense of what the simulation looks like logistically, this video I would recommend clicking on and just kind of skimming through to see uh, what it looks like. You'll be able to see kind of the Zoom participants, the screen sharing when you're off into breakout rooms. So you'll get a little bit of insight into what the flow looks like, even though the content might be a little bit different, uh, but the flow is relatively similar. So that's something I would suggest if you're looking for more insight into those uh, exact logistics of the platform. Great. Is there anything else we'd like to touch upon, Yasmin, before we close out? Um, I don't think so. Thank you all so much. I'll just put, again, uh, our emails here if you are interested in reaching out to us in case we haven't uh, answered your questions or maybe uh, we might need uh, to take a little bit of time for a longer answer. Uh, we are pretty responsive over email. So these are our direct emails, uh, as well as the support platform where you can email us as well, uh, and we'll happily answer any of your questions. Uh, and just to reiterate again, uh, we'll be sending out a recording of this, uh, a link to the world climate simulation that we plan to hold in about uh, a week and a half. And uh, you're able to email us back if you would like a copy of these slides. So we're hoping that we're able to support you in those ways uh, of getting ready for your simulations. So uh, feel free to email us uh, any way that works best for you. And we're really hoping that we can uh, help answer any of your questions. All right, thank you everyone. Have a wonderful day. Looking forward to being in touch with you all soon. Take care.